So thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so what I'm going to present uh, today is some work that I've been uh, that I've done in, in San Diego with uh, Jeremy Palacci and also Etienne Ducro who was in uh, NYU and is now in CRPP in Bordeaux. And so what we were looking at is what is the dynamic of a uh, uh, colloidal layer. So what you're seeing in the background right there uh, when you introduce a few micro swimmers. So it's hardly visible in there, but it's those little uh, beads that you see there. And so what we saw is that um, when you, so the activity of this intruder is gonna speed up uh, considerably the, the annealing process within the layer. So if you look at um, what is happening in the living, actually there's a lot of process that make use of uh, active fluctuation or active elements. And so I'm showing a couple in here. So here you have a molecular motor that is dragging a cargo along the filaments and so that it's going faster than uh, it would just by um, diffusion. And so this is another uh, nice example that is coming from the team of uh, UL Forter in Marseille. And so what they were looking at is they were looking at gravisensor plants. And so what it is, it's a cell with a pile of grain. And so the cell is able to detect inclination when the pile is avalanching. And so there's a shortcoming with this kind of thing because you have to go beyond a given uh, angle for the pile to avalanche. And so that gives you a really poor, I mean, uh, accuracy. So what they saw is that actually in living system, so those things make use of uh, active fluctuation within the cell so that it starts to avalanche way before at small angle. And so this is a beautiful example where those active fluctuation are helping uh, th those processes. And so where we are now is that uh, with the advance that we've made in synthesis, we're able to make um, similar kind of things so that are able to uh, consume energy and transform it into motion. And so that gives us also the possibility uh, to accelerate processes that are going on. And for example, to uh, um, drive the reorganization of a colloidal layer. So just to talk about, about a bit about colloids, uh, which have been introduced before. So those are uh, micron sized beads that are dispersed in fluids. And so those have been uh, interesting model system of hard sphere uh, that gave insight into the behavior of matter. The reason is it's easier to track uh, than atom because it's bigger and uh, it's evolving over a longer time scale. And so people have been using it, for example, to look at the motion of grain boundary and still be able at the same time to resolve what is happening at the, the, um, the level of a single uh, atom or a single colloid. So with the advent of uh, active particle uh, that can so move uh, within the system, it kind of opened a whole new framework to reinterpret what is going on in those system uh, out of the regular framework. And so I guess uh, in the next talk, uh, we'll have a really nice example of what happened if you put a, a active particle within those things and use it as a probe, to probe the, the mechanical property. And this is another nice example where they put so active particle, which are the blue dots right there. And you see something that is uh, significantly different from a thermal system where, so those active particle drive the particle to aggregate instead of spreading evenly as you would have in, um, in the thermal system. So this is the kind of behavior that we'll be looking at what happens when you drive a system out of equilibrium by putting active solar in there. So just to show you uh, what the experimental system look like. So we form a 2D layer of colloids by sedimentation on the bottom uh, wall of a sample cell. And so here uh, you see that those arrows are pointing at the swimmers. And so here is a, a bigger picture of what it is. So you have an emetite cube that is uh, so protruding out of uh, polymer beads. And so what is happening in the nutshell is that so those swimmers are able to convert uh, chemical energy into motion when you activate it with a UV light. What happens is when you shine the UV light, those emetite cube are going to decompose hydrogen peroxide that is into the solution. So this is going to create a gradient that propel the particle uh, sulfurate effect. And so you get typically this kind of motion. If you shine the, the, um, the sample, you have uh, those swimmer that exhibits so, um, a persistent random walk where they go into straight line and then uh, their uh, direction is randomized by uh, Brownian motion. And so what is uh, neat in this kind of system is that you can turn it off or turn it on if you so turn on or turn off the light. All right, so here is uh, what the system is looking like. So what we do is that when the, so we form the cell, and so when the colloids sediment on the bottom plate, you have a sudden uh, increase of the density. And so that quenches the system 
into a fully crystalline state. So what, what you see is that you see different grains, uh, so different domain with different orientation. And so we put swimmers in there. Uh, so you, what you see also is the, the particle are confined within the well that is embossed uh, in the bottom plane. And so that allows us to work with a fairly constant amount of uh, colloids throughout the experiment. And so I'll show you what happens. So on the left, uh, we have colloids. Uh, we have an uh, active swimmer, I'm sorry. And on the right, we have just a system with passive beads to see uh, the comparison between the two. So when I shine the lights, so you see on the left that you have all those uh, swimmers that are starting to propel. So you can't actually see them, but you can guess where they are by the trace that they live uh, within the crystal. And so I'm fasting forward a bit the video. And so what you see is that over a relatively short time scale, so within 40 minutes, you have the whole system that reorganized uh, in the single uh, in the crystal with a single orientation. Whereas on the other side, things are happening on a much longer time scale, and it's going to take about 12 hours for the system to converge towards a, a crystal with a single domain. So the question was then, uh, what is happening? So what are the swimmers doing and how are they modifying the behavior of the crystal? And so one thing that you can start to do is by looking at what happened uh, to the constituent of your system. So for example, what are uh, those swimmers doing? So as I said before, you can see them uh, by the trace that they leave. And so you can start to track where they're going in the, in the, in the crystal. So here I'm showing you a couple of trajectory and I highlighted some of them in black so that you can better see uh, what they're doing. And so what you see is that they're kind of following the local direction uh, of the crystal. So it's especially apparent if you look at uh, what is the distribution of the orientation of the motion within the crystal. And so they're moving with a speed and a persistent length that is uh, fairly close to the one that they, they would have in a free space, so without any obstacle. And if you look where they're going uh, within the whole uh, domain, they're kind of invading and uh, navigating through the whole domain with limited accumulation at the edges, meaning that you have a limited uh, phase separation. And so here I'm pointing with the, the, the black arrow to the value of the distribution for a uniform uh, distribution. So you see that they're evading uh, fairly well the whole uh, system. So then what you can look at is what is happening then for those passive beads uh, and what is going to be the impact of the activity of the swimmers. So you can start tracking all the beads and see what is happening. But what is happening is kind of difficult because it's going to depend on local rearrangement and also instantaneous interaction with the swimmers. So what we decided to do is that since swimmers are invading everywhere uh, and navigating everywhere, what we're going to do is that we're going to um, take a coarse grain approach and do an ensemble average over all the, the passive beads uh, in the in the well over the first 20 minutes uh, to see what is happening uh, to the beads in the in the in the well. So what we did is that we computed the the mean square displacement of the beads uh, over a different time scale, and you see that over longer time scale you have a diffusive behavior uh, of your passive beads within the system. And so the first game that you can start to do is that since uh, you, your active swimmer or light activated. The first thing you can do is change the intensity of your UV light so that they go faster and faster and see what happens to the beads in the medium. So this is what you can do. And you see that when you increase um, the activity of the, of the swimmers, the diffusivity increase, and you can compare that to a uh, thermal bath without any uh, activity. The second thing that you can do is uh, you can keep the, the speed constant, but increase the number of swimmers. So this is what we, can, we did. And so I'd just like you to keep in mind that, so we increase the number of swimmers, but we still stay with a fairly small number of swimmers. So we have uh, about 0.5 to a 5% numeric fraction. So very low amount of swimmers so that you can think of it as kind of dopants uh, in, in the system. And so you see that the uh, diffusivity increase within the system. And if you want to gather all those uh, effects uh, in one thing, you can replot uh, those uh, data so the diffusivity as a function of alpha v, and you see that you have a nice collapse onto a, a, certain, a single curve. And so one way to kind of rationalize what is happening is by using a model of collision, which basically is saying that if you were one uh, colloid within, within the system, 
So the rate of collision that you're going to have with the swimmer is going to depend on, well, how much uh, swimmer you have in your system, the speed of your swimmers. So the faster the swimmers, uh, the greater the chance of encounter uh, with the swimmer. And then in interaction lengths that basically uh, reflect the fact that even though the swimmer might move a little bit away from me, I'm still going to feel its effects uh, and it's still going to make me move. And so you have the, your rate of collision. And so every time you have a collision, it's going to displace you by a distance d. That doesn't depend on the speed of your uh, swimmer, meaning that it's only set by steric effect. You don't have any entrainment uh, every time a swimmer passes. And so from that, you can derive uh, what is going to be the effect of activity on the diffusivity. And you get a scaling uh, that depends on alpha v uh, that corresponds to what you see uh, in, in, in there. And so you can actually uh, fit that to your data. And from uh, this fit, extract what would be those distances right there. And you get exactly what you would have uh, in the experiment, that things move uh, by distance of a few micron, as you see on the picture right there. So we've been looking at uh, the behavior uh, of the constituents. The next step, if you want to understand what is going on, is well, what is the effect that uh, those uh, behavior are going to have on the macroscopic reorganization of the layer? And so one way to kind of uh, quantify and visualize uh, the organization of the crystal within the, the layer is to compute uh, the bond order parameter. So this is based on, so it's computed for each colloid and it's based on the arrangement of the neighbor. And so the amplitudes of this thing is going to tell you how close you are to a hexagonal structure. But more uh, importantly for us, the, the phase is going to tell us what is the local orientation of your crystal. And so here I'm color coding uh, each colloid uh, with respect to the local orientation. And so that helps us to see different grain with a different orientation. So we have that. And if you want to see in time how this uh, grain structure is going to evolve, so one thing that you could be doing is look at the correlation of those orientation as a function of distance. So if you take two points that are close to each other, they are highly correlated uh, in orientation. And this correlation decay uh, as you get further and further. And so in line with uh, something that has been done by Lila Verne and collaborator, what thing that you can do is uh, to define kind of a, a typical length scale for your grain. That is the distance over which those correlation have, drawn, have dropped by a half. And so this is not really uh, average size of your grain. But it's more of a representative uh, length scale uh, within your system to characterize the grain structure. So you can look at how this is evolving in time. And so I'm showing you a, uh, a movie where you see how the, the difference of grain are evolving. And so what you see is so the, the, the color here uh, represents time. So you start from something that is um, not very correlated over long distances and how you when so when you the structure evolve in time you correlate over longer and longer distance and so if you look at what happened here you have so larger grain that appear at the expense of smaller one and so this whole process also tends to uh, favor crystallites that uh, are compatible with the the, um, the boundary limit that are right there so you tend to converge towards uh, a very big um, a very big grain so you can look then at, oh, so yeah, by the way, um, so if you replot all those uh, curve, coloration curve as a function of the distance uh, non-dimensionalized by that uh, characteristic length scale, you see that you have a rescaling that is independent, independent of time, meaning that you have a self-similar grain structure where um, this uh, R R6 that we defined uh, is uh, uh, a relevant length scale. All right, so this uh, order that develops within the, the, the crystal, you can um, represent it by the evolution of so this typical length. So I remind you it's this point here that is uh, growing and growing. And so what you see is that over time, so the, the typical size of your grain uh, is increasing. So here it's given in terms of number of uh, colloid diameter. And you go up to about 20 colloids. So, um, so and so this is about the, the it starts to be a size that is comparable to the, the, the size of your, of your system. 
and you can compare it to what happened, uh, which is much smaller uh, for uh, much slower for a thermal system. So one thing that you can do is that uh, you can compare that to uh, lows that exist uh, for the growth of grains. And so, for example, it has a reasonable uh, agreement with a normal grain growth, which look like this. And so this is where the motion of your grain boundary are driven by uh, curvature, just like you would have for uh, um, surface tension in the liquid. And so the reason why we do this is uh, because then we can extract uh, this gamma factor, which is something that has to do with the how mobile your grain boundary are. And so this is going to be for us a measure of the, the evolution of the structure, depending on uh, how fast the swimmers are going or how many swimmers uh, we're going to have. And so we measured that for a uh, different number of swimmer, different speeds. And so what you get is that, so here it's reported, you have, you can have up to a 40 fold uh, acceleration of the evolution of the grain structure compared to what happened for a thermal system. And so you can compare this uh, global evolution of, the, of the, the crystal to what is happening at the microscopic level, so which is represented by the diffusion. And you see that the two correlate uh, fairly well. So the more the particle are going to be fused, the faster the system is going to evolve. And so what is maybe more uh, interesting is if you replot those data as a function of one over d, one over the diffusion. And so what you see is that you have kind of a Arrhenius-like uh, low, meaning that things evolve faster uh, for a system that is hotter. Okay, so this is two minutes, no, five minutes. Okay. So when you start to diffuse more, so when your system is hotter, uh, things go faster. So in a way, what is happening is that the colloids are providing uh, the energy to overcome the barrier uh, that it takes uh, to start moving the grain boundary. And so from a fit of this, you can actually uh, derive what is going to be the activation uh, energy to move your, your grain boundary. And so that gives you something of the order of couple of KT, which kind of makes sense for entropy barrier of a system of a hard sphere. So one thing that you can also do is uh, do numerical simulation to corroborate uh, what is happening and also to be able to change things that you can change in experiments. So this is the work of uh, Etienne. And uh, so we did a kind of minimal, a simple uh, system of Brownian dynamic simulation where you have a layer, uh, a 2D layer of uh, 20K colloids. Uh, and so some of the particle are made active by applying uh, an extra force on them. And so here is uh, what have you, you observed within the whole system and here is zoom uh, of what is happening in, uh, in one part. And so you see that you have globally the same uh, behavior, visually the same behavior as what is happening in experiment with those swimmer that kind of come through the crystal uh, and reorganize the layer. And you can play the game that we play in the experiment of uh, increasing the speed, for example. And so you get exactly the same kind of behavior. So you have uh, an, a system that is activated. Uh, so a barrier that is overcome thanks to the, the swimmer. And so then, an easy interpretation that you could have of this is that, well, so swimmers are kind of like hot colloids uh, that are enabling uh, to overcome barrier, but you see that it's a little more subtle than that. And this you can see uh, in simulation. Uh, so a nice thing ab about simulation is that you can change stuff that you can change in the experiment. So for example, change the persistent length of your swimmer, so how far they go um, before changing direction. So this is what uh, uh, so Etienne did. So here is with persistent length of about seven colloids, which is comparable to what we have in the experiment. And so you see exactly the same thing that is happening before. And here is a smaller a persistent length that is less than the size of a colloid. So you see that this one is annealing slower than the other one. But more importantly, there's something also really different in the dynamics in that here, your uh, swimmers start to accumulate at the grain boundary. So the, it's where uh, they're gonna encounter a smaller stiffness uh, to motion. And so then you get stuff that are comparable to a previous result in simulation. So you see that it's, it's not so, um, uh, I mean, it's a little more subtle in, in what the effect of uh, those swimmers are gonna have uh, on, the, on, the, on the dynamics. And so I, I think as a, so as a last slide, um, I'll leave you with that. So since, um, 
your swimmer or light activated. So one thing that you could do is that you could also activate spatially only one part of the system. And so this is what we did here using a light pattern. So we shine the light only on the, the, the left part and we don't shine the light on the right part and you'll see what happens. So you have, so you could actually measure the, the how diffusive the particle are uh, on both sides of uh, this interface. And so what you see is that you can control spatially how much they're gonna move uh, with a fairly good resolution of about like the size of a code. And so this has an effect on uh, the rate of annealing of your structure. So on the left side, stuff are uh, organizing and realigning, whether it's evolving on a much longer time scale on the right side. And so I'll leave you with that uh, on the idea that, so introducing a few colloids is uh, significantly changing the dynamics of your layer. And so the control of the, the, the active fluctuation, especially and temporally um, that it offers, uh, enable also to kind of tune the material property of uh, the system uh, in which uh, you're putting it in. Um, so if you're interested, uh, there, there's uh, this paper that has been published in uh, uh, 2019 and uh, I'll answer uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, it was a wonderful talk, let's uh, clap virtually and uh, uh, I welcome any questions. Feel free to say something in the chat or even unmute yourself. Um, I, I, had a, I had a quick question that's maybe a bit naive, but uh, one, one thing I find surprising on the light on side here in the, uh, on the side, for example, is the fact that the system relaxes at all to a uniform state, despite having you know, quite a, su a substantial amount of activity going on, right? Is that sort of a generic behavior that you see, or do you ever see other steady states that have, you know, that still have grain boundaries, even at long times? So, I mean, I think one of the reason why uh, the having swimmer just is not like shuffling forever things is because it's still uh, kind of a dilute system. So the, the surface fraction is about 68%, I think. And so even, so even though you still have swimmer going in there, uh, they still have, so they have space to go through. And so when they kind of come through, once it's reorganized, it's not um, disorganizing uh, the, the system. So let me, let me uh, see if I understood this correctly. One way to think about it is that there are still large patches uh, that are sort of local that have the time to relax and uh, to equilibrium after the swimmer has gone through and that sort of restores the crystal in order is that how you think about it um okay so what i understood from your question is uh how come that mm. so it's still it's still in that organized state afterwards even though you have uh, intruders in there yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what i was trying to uh to to say is that um, swimmers have, have space to, uh, to swim in there. Um, and so once, once the, the thing is organized, they have those, I mean, it, it's kind of an avenue to go through where they're gonna minimally disturb uh, the, the organized structure, if that yep. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, we have a question from Francesco. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself? So the, 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 the question is actually very related to Anton's question. Anyway, so if you look at the structure of the funnel, steady state, is it very similar? Can you quantify how, how similar it is to the ground uh, equilibrium structure in that sense? If you look at, I don't know, for example, the GeoVa, and the, are there any differences that the, that the, that the active particle still uh, induce into the structure or not? You mean so once it's organized? Yeah. So if you were to compare to the uh, equilibrium lattice that you expect, for example. Um, so I haven't, I have, um... We have, so what we've been doing is, uh, for example, looking at this view of our, when it's disorganized and which, when it's organized, uh, we haven't been looking at whether there's a difference for an organized one uh, with a swimmer or not swimmer. Okay. Um, but it's, so yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's I, I'll guess it's, it's fairly close. Yeah, it's totally, it's very close. I would say whether there is any systematic effect you can, uh 
uh, trace out. But uh, I think from what you said to to Anton, essentially you you expect roughly the same behavior and, and negligible corrections. Okay. And uh, we have a question from Demian. Would you like to? Uh... Yeah. So my my question also is a kind of follow up of uh, Anton's comment. So uh, you, so about this. Yeah, this this coupling between the structure and the dynamics of these intruders. So you you, you showed us that for small persistence length, uh, these active particles move along the brain boundaries, and if you yeah if you increase the the driving, then they can eventually get into uh, into these domains of different orientations. So do, do you have an idea uh, if if there is some kind of a persistence length threshold where the dynamics of these intruders change or, or any hints about the, the dynamics of the intruders in general? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we tried, uh, so we tried different persistent lengths. And so the, the, the transition happened roughly at about 0.4. And so, I mean, it's, it's something that is of the order of the size of the collate physicist. And uh, so in this paper, it's actually a bit different. Uh, what they do is that they have uh, intruders that are uh, bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not easy for them to actually sort of move uh, throughout the crystal, which is when it gets closer to a small persistent length when they tend to move uh, within a, a small space. Okay, I see. Because I guess that even, even for large pers persistence length, uh, the particles here have a preference to move along the brain boundaries. I mean, this preference is always there because there is more room for them to move. So that was actually surprising. That, that was uh, kind of what we would assume. Uh, but if, if you look at the, the trajectory, it's not, um, since they have space, uh, it's, it's not particularly uh, preferring moving along the grain boundary. It's really invading the whole, the whole thing. Uh, okay. Okay, so thanks. And uh, Manuela, uh, uh, maybe one quick question. Uh, okay, uh, also then I, I will ask uh, just one more question. I had to, uh, it's just more of a curiosity. So I, I know, or I've heard that uh, um, when you use uh, hydrogen peroxide and you have this kind of uh, uh, diffusophoresis, then you have a lot of uh, sort of quote unquote waste. And did you, uh, did you have to, how did you deal with this uh, in this kind of system? Did you have some kind of a way to recycle the waste? So what, what are you calling waste? So, I mean, you, when you have uh, hydrogen peroxide and then you, uh, I mean, I think it's the same thing that I know, then you have a chemical reaction that produces water and uh, oxygen. Yeah. So this is something that you, yeah, you can't really avoid. So at some point you have bubbles appearing in the system. So you have a limited time uh, to do your experiments, um, which, which works in that case since uh, it reorganized over a time scale of about an hour. Uh, but you can't go much longer. And so a whole, a whole lot of your experiment also, you have to throw away because there's a bubble appearing uh, in the system. Okay, right? I just thought, yeah, I just thought that it was short, a shorter time, uh, you know, the available, so to speak. But an hour is, um, okay, so that answers that answer yes. my question. 